worship this morning. Um, the call to worship is adapted from Psalm 73, and it reminds us that God alone is to be our hope, strength, and desire. So join me in declaring these words together. Let's say this together. Whom have we in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that we desire besides you. Our flesh and our heart may fail, but God is the strength of our heart and our portion forever. The psalm uh, goes on to say that it is good to be near God and to make him our refuge and to tell of all his works. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to tell of God's works. So join the choir as we sing together. Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise. Please be seated. To all who are weary, hear this invitation from Jesus. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're just going to take a, a minute or so, just silent prayer. Let's consider this, this, this invitation from Jesus. Bring your burdens before the Lord. Carrying our burdens. Pray this in your name. Amen. Stand and hear the good news. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Amen? Amen. Who has held the
privilege, we wanted to take just a moment, uh, even right in the middle of our service, to, in a way, uh, gather together as a truly a, a family of faith and to process some of the events of last week. Uh, some of you were with us in the 9 o'clock service, some the 1045. Uh, some of you perhaps were first-time guests last week. Maybe some of you are first-time guests this week. Uh, and, and you had either heard or saw through our Realm communication last Sunday evening the news about Colin Carroll, who served as one of our missionaries, who very suddenly and tragically passed away. And we wanted to take some time to process that as a family. Um, uh, many of you at the 9 o'clock service, uh, last Sunday was Sunday as normal. Some of you at the 1045 remember that we closed the service a bit early. Some of you, as I mentioned, are first-time guests last week or this week. Some of you uh, had not had the opportunity to meet Colin. Some of you have known Colin for decades. So we're experiencing this, all of us together, in a very different way. But we wanted to take some time to process uh, that um, Colin, as many of you saw in that communication, had shared in the 9 o'clock service last week, was feeling unwell, uh, laid down uh, for a brief uh, rest, and our staff and key volunteers saw that uh, his condition was serious, uh, called first responders. And we now know in hindsight that as best as we understand the situation, he closed his eyes for a brief rest between services and woke up in glory. Now this, of course, um, is a shocking uh, experience for all of us uh, to go through together. And because this was a missionary who had just shared and who passed away on a Sunday morning at the building, we saw it necessary to circle back in a, in a public way and process this together. Uh, these are reminders that it says in Scripture that as Christians we grieve with hope, both at the same time. That in, in a profound way, because Colin knew Jesus, he is home. It, and it, equally at the same time, there's pain and loss. Some of you have known Colin for decades, discerned his call to the mission field here at Village. We sent him uh, from Village. Many of you have served by him and known him for years. This is a shock for us. And for many of you, this is going to stir other seasons and times of grief and loss. It can be a compounding experience. So just a few things very briefly, I think, that help us process loss or grief or sudden loss or tragic loss. Number one, God knows our days. God knows our days. Uh, Psalm 139, verse 16 says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. He knows our days. He is sovereign. Uh, along with that, we also know that God knows our pain. Uh, John 11:35, the shortest verse in the entire Bible, two words, Jesus wept. And this small verse has profound implications that at the loss of Jesus' friend Lazarus, it says that our Lord wept. And that means that when we come to God with sudden loss or even tragic loss, we don't come to a God that's aloof or distant or cold. And we, we come to a God who can do more than sympathize. He doesn't just say what you are going through, wow, that must be difficult. Jesus says, I've been there, I know. He wept at Lazarus' death. We come to a sympathetic and empathetic Savior. He knows our days, he knows our pain, and he can undo death. God himself, because he passed through death and came out the other side, all those who are in him, we too, will pass through death and out the other side into glory. Uh, John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. So as we process this uh, together, uh, we recognize uh, that probably the best way to make sense of a sudden loss like this is one that we remind ourselves that when it's our time to be welcomed home, our God welcomes us home. And we don't go just into a dark, cold nothingness. We come into the loving arms of God our Savior in glory. Shock for us. Glory for Colin. And because this was something that we all experienced together, to our knowledge of processing and debriefing with the team, I think this is a first for Village, a loss on a Sunday morning at our, at our building in this uh, manner, in this way. 
And because of that, we found it fitting to process together. And I want to very briefly thank a few groups of people. Um, we had some staff and, and key volunteers who were first uh, to help and care, to take swift and wise action. Thank you. You know who you are. Uh, we also want to thank uh, our first responders. I recognize that those who responded last week might not be here this week, but I know I'm speaking to many of you who serve as first responders in a variety of different ways. When the phone calls you, it's often difficult news and you run toward it, not away from it. Thank you for running toward us in our time of need. And I also want to thank you. Um, it can be a confusing experience whether you first uh, saw the news in our Realm communication last week, whether you were at our 1045 service, it can be a confusing experience to leave a service that has ended a little bit early and you're understanding something is going on but you don't know all the details. I want to thank you because you responded patiently and prayerfully, and I'm grateful uh, for that. And let me now just pray. And after I pray, we're actually going to continue in song. Why? Why are we doing this right in the middle of a service? Because this was a public event last week, we wanted to have a public response this week. And I think there's something very fitting as we process difficulty or loss together as a church family. There's perhaps no more fitting response than to then, after hearing and processing this news, to turn our focus Godward. He is our comfort. Um, he is our help. That when everything around us is changing, he is unchanging, he is faithful. And I think we need that, that reminder, even today. So let me pray. Pray along with me in the quietness of your heart and mind for Linda, Colin's wife, for us as a church family, for the ministry that Colin had here and overseas, for our brothers and sisters in, in the Philippines um, who are processing this loss as well. Pray quietly in your heart as I pray for us. And then we will continue in musical worship. Let me pray. Father, we just pause together and we come before you. Lord, moments like these, and I know I'm in the presence of, of many who have experienced loss, many who have experienced sudden loss, and some who have experienced tragic and sudden loss. And Lord, when we go through this together, I pray that you would use it in such a way that it brings comfort to those in desperate need of comfort, hope and encouragement to those in need of hope and strength and grace and mercy and help in time of need. Lord, we pray for Linda. We pray for Colin's wife. Would you remind her of your nearness? Remind her, Lord, and all of us as we think through our seasons of loss, Lord, that even in the valley, you are with us. That darkness is not dark to you, or that you, light of the world, uh, step in and shine in and lift us up out of even the hardest, darkest, loneliest moments of our life to remind us you're already there, you're already with us, that in Christ we take no step of this journey alone, every step of the way. You walk beside, you follow behind, you lead before. Thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, I pray for us as a church family, as we mourn this loss together of one of our missionaries, one of our, our global team. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the Philippines, uh, Lord, that this news to them, as it is to us, quite a shock. We pray for the ministry. We thank you for Colin's uh, uh, faithful ministry uh, of, of pouring in to the beautiful nation of the Philippines and the people there, Lord. Would you comfort them, carry on the work, that he has so faithfully poured his life into. And Father, we bring all of these things with that truth ringing in our ears. You know our days. It, Lord, it's, it's a sobering reminder, and yet it's a hopeful reminder. You know our days, and you will welcome us home. You are near to us in pain and suffering. You mourn and weep with us. And Lord, you guide through death back to glory. So Father, may this certainly, grief in hope, stir our hearts to you. I pray this in your name. Amen. In the heart of a book called Lamentations, a book of lament, um, there's this great 
this great window of the hope that we have in our unchanging God, our God who there's no shadow of, of turning with thee. Um, I'm going to, before we sing Grace Thy Faithfulness, I'm going to read this passage from Lamentations. Let's stand in reverence for God's word as we remember these truths. Here's the prayer. Remember my affliction and my wanderings. The wormwood and the gall, my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Let's read this together. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Let's lift our voices together. Great is thy Sing with our heart. Sing this prayer together.
What grace, what comfort, what hope is there for the weary, the worn out, the overworked, the unseen, the overburdened, those extended far beyond their capacity, those running on fumes, what grace and help and comfort is there for you? Mary received it, Martha needed it, Jesus has it, and you need it too. So let me pray, and then let's look at God's word together. Father, man, as we just sang, Lord, thank you for that. There is no other place to go. There is no other person to go more fitting to bring our greatest needs and our greatest joys other than you. Uh, So, Father, I pray as we look at your word, may that prayer be our prayer now as we turn our hearts and our attentions to what you have first said to us, your message to us. Mold our hearts, shape our hearts, humble us, encourage us, strengthen us. And I pray specifically, Lord, for the weary, those who are tired. Lord, a tiredness uh, that goes beyond just needing a rest or a nap, a tiredness that goes beyond just needing a weekend or a vacation, a tiredness of soul, Lord, that desperately needs the comfort and care and gospel rest that our souls need. So, Father, would you, would you minister to us today, minister to me today, through me, to your people, through your word, to all of us, that we might see uh, you are enough and that you sustain and that you guide our steps. So move now, Lord, through the preaching of your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 10. Meet me there as we go through this series, Christ and his disciples, as we see just how practical, just how honest and everyday and ordinary but not ordinary this journey of discipleship truly is, how it touches every aspect of our lives. Luke uh, chapter 10. Today we're going to be looking at verses 38 uh, to 42. Some of you know this passage all too well. This well-known story of Martha and Mary when they host Jesus in their home. Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 38. And and before we we read a portion, uh, can you imagine being there? Can you imagine being with Martha and, and Mary when you're, you're hosting the King of Kings, the God of God, the Messiah, the second David, the second Adam, Jesus in your home? So you can see it. Maybe, you know, Martha, is, as Jesus is going along, uh, Martha welcomes Jesus into her home. And uh, I don't know about you, but if you've ever hosted a, 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 a person that you couldn't believe that you're in their presence, it takes our head and our mind to, to unique places, and this is exactly where the story uh, picks up. And it says in verse 38, as they went on their way, Jesus and his disciples, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed Jesus into her home. And she had a sister, Martha did, called Mary, who sat. And she sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. So this is how the story opens. This is how the scene opens, that Mary, uh, the sister, is sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus. This posture of discipleship, this posture of of, of submission to his lordship, uh, this posture of um, learning and listening, this uh, glimpse into this journey of discipleship that uh, discipleship is not reserved for only a select few, but for all who believe, for all who say, yes, I want to follow this lord, this teacher, this master, this king. And Mary is listening to the teaching of Jesus right there in, imagine this, your living room. Uh, Meanwhile, Martha is in the other room working through her, you know, the pump-up routine. You're hosting Jesus in your house. And I don't know about you, but, you know, sometimes we go into, you know, host mode. And Martha would have, you know, pulled out, you know, her second-degree black belt host mode you know, skills. You're hosting Jesus. It doesn't say, but it makes you wonder, you know, was she in the room? You know, deep breath. Jesus is in my house. He's in my house. He's in my house. He's in my house. He's in the other room. What am I going to serve him? What am I going to do? And this is where uh, she would have locked in to all, I mean, you pull out all the stops when the king of kings is in your house. All of the sacred dishes that the children shall not touch. 
all of the things that have been passed down, only the finest food, only the best, that you would bring your A-game when God is in your house. So here's Martha, and you can, you can start to hear the hustle and bustle as she is as she's, uh, rummaging through, uh, through the uh, cupboards looking for the cumin and the chickpeas, as she's pulling out the freshest of fish, as she's cutting things and preparing things, and it's somewhat of a flurry. And as Martha is, is, is over here in this other room preparing all these things, and she's looking through the cupboards, and, you know, where's the cumin? And then, Mary, do you know where the, the cumin is? Where, where, did she, where did she always puts it in the wrong place? And she's rummaging through. Mary, do you, and Mary... And she peeks into the other room, and there Mary is sitting. Did I mention sitting? Sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to what he is saying. And Martha goes, you know, back at it as she is preparing things. And I don't know, but it makes you wonder, (laughs) did she start to chop the fish with a little extra vigor in the other room? (laughs) Did she start to rummage through cupboards and close them with a little extra oomph in her swing? Uh, There's a tone that we can communicate without a word. (laughs) As she put bread on the platter and started to cut it with some little extra, maybe she started to mutter to herself, "What, what is she doing? God is in our house. We're supposed to host him after all. After all, in a hospitality-rich culture, did not Jesus say in Luke chapter 10, verse 5, whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. Verse 7, remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, like Martha and Mary are doing, eat what is set before you. Well, that food's not just going to put it on the plate and the table by itself. Someone's got to prepare it. Hands have to make it ready. So here's Martha in the other room, being a host, uh, preparing the food. You almost hear her mutter to herself, I wonder what they're talking about. I I, I sure hope Jesus is reminding my sister, Mary, about the Good Samaritan, who I am very helpful that the Good Samaritan didn't sit down for a nice little chat when someone was in need of service, you know. Maybe Jesus is reminding Mary of uh, Luke chapter 7, the inhospitable Pharisee. Remember that story? Who when Jesus came into his house, no oil for his head, no water for his feet, no kiss on his cheek. As for me and my house, Martha says, "Mm -hmm, we will serve the Lord. So here she is. (laughs) Starting, you know, there's smoke coming from the kitchen, but it's not from the oven. (laughs) Here is Martha trying to be a good host. And somewhere between welcome into my house and where did Mary leave the cumin, Martha's had it. <laughs> so she, she, she storms over to the other room and she expresses her frustration, get this, not just with Mary, but with Jesus. Look at, look at what she says. Look at what she says. But Martha was distracted She was distracted. She was distracted with much serving. And after that, she went up to him, Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister, there's a little tone, I think, in that, my sister has left me to serve alone. Tell her then to help me. Now, the Bible doesn't say, the text doesn't say, this has firstborn written all over it. (laughs) Oh, any siblings in the house today, any firstborns that can relate, that think, you know what, Martha, I got you. I've been there. Lord, do, do, you not, do you not care? That means Martha has gone way beyond frustrated at Mary, which maybe was commonplace. Well, Mary, Mary, it's always me. I'm always the responsible. I'm always the one getting things ready. I'm always the, Here's Mary sitting while I am working, but she goes beyond frustrated at Mary, and now she's frustrated at Jesus because after all, Is not God on the side of the firstborn? (laughs) Certainly, God would be in my corner. Certainly, the Lord would know that the right action to take would be shoo Mary into the other room to come help me. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. So, poor Martha, a little overworked, a little underseen, Uh, feeling a little bit alone, 
a little bit tired, a little bit distracted, a little bit frazzled, a little bit flustered in this moment. See how honest this picture of discipleship is? People in Jesus' time are not so different than we are. Not so different than us. We've all been there. Uh, you haven't slept as you wish you could have. Blood sugar is not at places where it needs to be. Uh, you're feeling like you need a little bit of help, and it's not coming from the other room uh, to help you out. We've all been there. Martha was there with her sister Mary and with Jesus. So Jesus responds. Jesus responds. Look at verse 41. But the Lord answered Martha, 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 you are anxious and troubled about many things. Thank you. Yes, I am, Lord. I am anxious and troubled about many things because there's many things to be anxious and troubled about. But if I had some help, if my sister Mary would just come help me, I wouldn't be so anxious and troubled about the many things. Martha, 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 you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken from her. And at this point, we're all left a little bit confused. Wait a second, what about, what about all this love God, love people stuff? I'm trying to serve the Lord. Literally, serve the Lord. Food and be a good host. H how could I be so right and yet so wrong? How could, I be so, how could I be so in the bullseye yet completely off target? What's going on here? <laughs> Why does Jesus respond in this way? And by the way, hear the care, hear the compassion, hear the tenderness. Martha, Martha, and we've all needed to hear those words. Your name, insert your name there. <laughs> David, David, you're anxious and troubled about many things. There's a lot of things going on. Work, right, for you. Doctor appointments, dentist appointments, after school activities, homework for your kids, groceries uh, to be purchased. You get a phone call on the way home from uh, the grocery store, and it's a sibling from the other side of the state to the other side of the country that you're trying to keep in touch with. It's been a while, so you start to chat with them. But then you realize you're sitting in the car for too long. The milk's going to spoil. That means another run to the grocery store that you have to do tomorrow. But that's when you had to reschedule your dentist appointment that got canceled last week because of something unexpected that happened with your children while your spouse is, is swamped at work and, and, and you need some help. Have you been there? <laughs> Martha? Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is necessary. How could Martha be so right and yet so off? I don't think it was a busyness thing per se. I think it was a distracted thing. That all of these good things that Martha was doing for Jesus had distracted her from the one good thing. She was doing good things. But the good portion, the good portion, the best portion, the true portion, which will not be taken away from Mary, is the better choice of the two. I don't think it's a service thing. It's whenever all of these good things um, displace or get in the way of or distract from or, or, or push God off the throne of our heart. When that takes place, when that happens, we start to take the path of Martha. And we start to forget and lose sight on the good portion. What is the portion? What is this good portion? Psalm 16, uh, verse 5 says, The Lord is my portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. That The good portion is the person that's waiting in the living room in the other side of the house who's waiting to be seen, waiting to be noticed by distracted us. Have you been there? <laughs> I've been there. I think this passage is showing us, it's telling us that God is calling us to let our service for him flow from our time with him, not distract us from time with him. Let all the good things that you're doing, the ministry that you're involved in, the ministry that you're involved in here at Village, the spouse that God has given you, the children that God has given you, the vocation that God has given you, the, the neighbors that God has given you, the family members that God has given you, all the responsibilities God has given you, the people that you oversee, 
the budgets that you balance, uh, the projects that you are called to steward, uh, the relationships that you are called to pour into, all of these things are good things. And when we do them out of a heart, and we're saying, Lord, I'm, I'm trying to serve you, and, and may that service flow from time with God instead of distract us and pull us away from God himself. Because true rest, true rest, real rest, and I'm talking about as I prayed at the beginning of the message, not, not just rest where we, where we need a little bit of Caribbean air in our lungs, <laughs> but the kind of rest of soul that even a long weekend or a short work week cannot satisfy, the rest of soul that only God can provide. True rest, that kind of rest, is, is more than just a lack of activity. It's a proximity and closeness with God. It's an abiding fellowship in nearness with the Savior that can only come from first relationship with Him and then number two, time with Him. Time spent with Him. And, and, and here is... Uh, Poor Martha. And I say it that way because this passage is all too relatable. And I, I, I appreciate who I'm speaking to. We're, we're Westerners. We're Americans. We take pride in how busy we are. We, we draw a sense of, of, of worth and value by, by how swamped we are at our work. There's something celebrated uh, in our culture about being busy, keeping a lot of plates spinning. But do you see what can happen? That even the good things in our life, the good things that we're, that we're, the answer is to not be good stewards of them. The answer is not just to neglect all the things that God has called you to be responsible for, but even the good things, if not careful, can start to distract us from the very one that we're trying to serve. And, and ironically so, we can get so distracted by doing good things for God that we forget to spend time with God. Just, the, just last week, as I was sitting down and preparing this message, <laughs> oh, the irony, there was a, a specific day last week, I distinctly remember waking up and thinking, you know what, I, I need to take the day. I just need to, I need, to, I need to recoup, I need to rest. I need to take the day. I can pick up the work um, on another day. I can shift around my schedule. I can do that. And there I am lying in bed thinking this thought, thinking I really need to take the day. And I thought, oh, but you know what, there's a lot of things to do. Emails to send, meetings to prepare for, messages to prepare for. So I roll in and start working on this message, this sermon, Martha and Mary. And all of a sudden, the power goes out. <laughs> and uh, the lights in the office go out. And I think, but Lord, I got I to gotta keep chugging away. I got to keep chugging away. There's a lot to do. And then a few minutes go on, and then I noticed uh, the internet was also out. Wow, Lord, but that's okay, because I don't need the internet right now. I could, I could do my emails later, but I got, other, I got other stuff to do. A few minutes go on, and the battery on my computer says, you've got 5% left. And I say, okay, Lord, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I yield. <laughs> David, <laughs> David. You are anxious and troubled about many things. I will kill the power. I will kill the internet. I'll kill your computer. <laughs> you need to spend time with me. And this is all too close to every single one of our hearts, isn't it? Why don't we rest? Why do we get so caught up in our work? One of the things that I stumbled across, this was said by, by another preacher, but I, it's, it's been so helpful to me. I keep coming back to it, and I want to share it with you. It's the very simple question, what is the work underneath your work? Sure, all of our lives, and with good things. I'm not saying quit your job. I'm not saying neglect your responsibilities. There's plenty of work that God calls us to pour into, and work is a good thing, but what's the work underneath it? Once you scrape away that first layer of your career or your relationships or your parenting relationships or uh, the friendships that you're pouring into, scrape away that top layer underneath it. What's the work that resides, the soul work that resides underneath the things that fill your time and your calendar? Think about your career. Have you found that as you're going about your vocation, your career, your nine to five, or your 
your eight to eight or whatever the shift might be, whatever the hours you pour in, have you ever realized that perhaps I'm not anxious and troubled about my work per se, but I'm actually anxious and troubled about a sense of security that I'm trying to cultivate or, or a sense of identity that I'm trying to build or perhaps uh, 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 the goals that are yet fulfilled in my life, the goals that I want to achieve for my, my spouse or, or my children or, or your grandchildren, that's the work underneath the work. So notice what happens to the heart. It's not about the emails anymore. It's not about the team that you're overseeing. It's not about the project that you're working on. It's not about the, the quarter that you're trying to meet. It's a deeper soul need that your work becomes an extension of a desire to, to, to acquire security, a desire to curate an identity. You start to look to your work uh, to be the very vehicle through which your goals and hopes and dreams are satisfied and fulfilled. But do you see what's going to happen? Performance review is going to come around, and it's not going to feel like an evaluation of what you do. It's going to feel like an evaluation of you. I'm wrapped up in what I do. And that work underneath our work can start to grab a hold of our hearts and grab a hold of our souls, and these are all things. Do you see what we're doing? We're looking to a savior. We're looking to a deliverer. We're looking to a provider. We're looking to uh, a, a sovereign deity to help map out the ways of our lives. So we don't just go to work. We live for it. We live for it. We can't rest. Think about your work. Think about your rest. Why won't you rest? Well, oh, no, come on, David. I, I can't. What do you mean, why won't I rest? I can't. Groceries and children and da, da, da. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. I can't rest. I looked at my calendar. The next time I'm going to have rest is sometime in 2024. I'll see you there. <laughs> but notice, I didn't say, why can't you rest? I said, why won't we rest? Why won't we? That's a soul question. When you have a pot, and I get it, they might be few, but they are there. When you have an opportunity to rest, why don't we? When we have a pocket during a weekend or the whole weekend, or when you have vacation days that you're not making room for or taking, why won't we? Have you ever, have you ever tried to rest or tried to go on vacation and you find yourself more anxious than you were than when you were actually working? <laughs> why is that? Perhaps underneath that is this idea that, that I am my productivity, that if I'm not producing something, if I'm not creating something, if I'm not carrying, moving the ball forward, then who am I? Then who am I? What do I do when I don't have my work? It's those times on vacation that we, we, we can't stop from checking. I'll just, I'll just check one, just one email. <laughs> I'll just, I, I just got to touch base with, you know, with, with some, one of my teammates. I, I'll just, just take care of this one thing. Before you know it, vacation's halfway over and we've forgotten to rest because our souls are attached to it. How about our work? How about our rest? How about our friendships? It can bleed into the relational realm. Have you ever wondered why you spend so much energy trying to please others, to, to go way above and beyond? Do you know what might be happening to your soul? You're looking not to that person for a friendship, to be a friend to them or for them to be a friend to you. You're looking to satisfy a deep soul need for acceptance, a deep soul need to be welcomed in, a deep soul need to be loved and cared for. And that friend isn't just a friend. They're your everything. That if you get rejected by them, then who am I? And we can be so anxious. It, it, it can put our headspace into a place of, man, if they reject me, then I'm done. Do you see what's happening? There's a soul work underneath that work. Or how about family members? Could it be, could it be, could it be that we get, can get very anxious about guiding our beloved family members, spouse, siblings, children, toward success and away from failure, perhaps not for their sake, but for our sake. Perhaps not for their good, but for our honor. That we start to look at the relationships, the family relationships we have around us, and somewhere our soul gets attached to this idea that they're, they're, they're little advertisements for me. And they're scurrying around, and their failures, I feel like, are attached to me. Their successes are, are attached to me. Now, I'm not talking about a natural loving concern, a natural loving care. The answer isn't just a cold, aloof, detached nature from those that we love most. But could it be that at some point along that journey, our soul 
looks at their failure and their success, and we don't need it for them. We need it for me. We need it for me. We're looking for honor. We're looking to know, am I a success? Have I failed? These are soul questions, but my friends, to every single one of these things, work, rest, friendship, family, and the list could go on and on. Now, my friends, apply the gospel. Apply the gospel. Come to me, all you are burdened and heavy laden. I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Lord, I don't want a yoke. That does, I mean, it still sounds kind of heavy, but he's talking about a rest for our souls, a soul kind of rest, because when we apply the gospel to all of these things, you're not going to be able to simply go to work instead of living for work until you see that he is your provider. Your vocation is not your provider. Your boss is not your provider. Your paycheck is not your provider. God is your provider. And until we see that, we're going to live for work. We're going we're to dig our fingers into it, and it's going to be attached to our soul until we see that God is our provider, God is our sustainer, God is our providential guide that makes his goals for our life uh, roll out throughout our life. He is our identity, not our productivity. Until we see that, we're not going to be able to simply go to work. Ever left work early and felt, oh, no. Oh, everyone's watching me go early. Maybe I'm not going to, I'll stay back. I'll stay back. Oh, yeah, we're busy, aren't we? We're, yeah. I got so much on my plate. We almost feel guilty going home because in some way our souls are attached to it. If the gospel is applied to your work, you're going to see you're not your productivity. Your vocation's not your provider. And your vocation is not, what, is not what's going to fulfill the goals that God has for your life. He does all of that. We're looking to our work and asking God-sized requests of it that only God can satisfy and only God can fulfill. How about our rest? You're not going to be able to be free to rest or to make time to rest until you see that God is always working so that when we lay down to rest, we know that the plates are going to keep spinning that he is going to keep working. He sustains all creation. He uh, guides our lives, and that frees us to rest because the world doesn't rest on our shoulders. You might feel, there, but there's a lot resting on my shoulders, and that might be very true. But until you see that all that has been given to you is stewarded by you, that God himself is the one sustaining all things, you've got to know that. And only then, only then will you be able to be free to rest. How about your friendships? You're never going to be able to handle rejection until you see that God calls you friend, that he accepts you by grace. If he doesn't, the triune Godhead, the inner, 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 inner circle, the triune Godhead isn't staring at you with arms crossed saying, huh, I wonder if they're good enough to join this circle. Let's watch and see. The triune Godhead takes pursuit of us, wanting to be near to us. He accepts us by grace. He calls us friend. And until we see that he will never leave us, never forsake us, until we see that we will never be rejected in Christ because he's died to secure us being welcomed in, only then will you be able to handle rejection of others. Hard? Absolutely, sure, but not devastating, not anymore. It'll free you up for your relationships. You'll start to care less. Again, not cold, not, not aloof, but a sense of the, the approval of others no longer has such a tight grasp on your soul. Why? Because he's got an even tighter grasp on your soul. Your work, your rest, your friendships, your family, those nearest and dearest to your heart, until you see that God is your honor, until you see that, that your identity is not wrapped up in the relationships around you, if your identity is wrapped up in Christ himself, that means the successes and failures of those nearest to you certainly might be hard. Absolutely, the failures or the successes certainly might bring you a sense of joy. But do you see what's going to happen? You won't be riding and falling on those successes and joys of others. You're going you're gonna to grasp for control less. You're still going to be involved, absolutely, but in a healthy way. You're going to be able to, to come alongside those nearest to you who have had incredible 
moments of failure in your life, and instead of you yourself being all torn up inside, oh my goodness, they're connected to me, look what all, everyone else is going to see, what do we do? You, you're going to be able to care for them in such a way from a place of security, knowing that God is your honor. God is your identity. Do you see what the gospel does? It frees us up to be faithful to what God has called us to be faithful to, our work, our activity. And then we can work from, from proximity with him, from abiding rest in him. And our work no longer distracts us from him because true rest, real rest, soul rest, the rest of our soul comes with that proximity to Jesus. We need that reminder periodically or daily, some of us. <laughs> we need that reminder. I am, I am Martha in this story. Every single one of us has moments in our week, in the month, where we find ourselves so wrapped up, so caught up in all that God has given us. We start to forget about him. Even the good things that we are trying to do for him, we forget that our portion is waiting to be seen by distracted us. He's always been there. We're the ones that get a little bit busy, tied up with other things. Would you turn and see that the Savior is there? Would you turn and see that that same invitation, come to me, all you are burdened and heavy laden, I will give you rest. It's a rest that you need, it's a rest that Martha needed, it's a rest that Mary points to, and it's a rest that Jesus offers. Won't you receive it? Won't you rest in it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this very honest picture about life and relationship and following you. So, Father, I, I pray, I pray, help us to not check our emails as a spiritual discipline. Help us to take the time off that you have provided for us as a statement of trust. Help us to spend time with you as a reminder to our souls that you are our portion, you are our savior, you are our sustainer. And Father, I pray that that would um, uniquely sharpen us, that as we serve you, Lord, it would be from a place of joy and delight, not of burden and anxiety and toil. So Father, I need this. I needed this this week. I'm gonna need it this next week. We need this, Lord. May we find that rest in you. Pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing, and the song's a prayer. So let's pray these words to the Lord. Sing. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh 
Good morning. morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Uh, welcome to Village. If we haven't met before, my name is Eric. I serve as the adult discipleship pastor here. Uh, we're really glad you're here this morning. It's great to worship you. If you're visiting or new with us, I, we especially want to welcome you. Uh, there is a welcome center out in the lobby right through the doors. We would love to get to know you better, answer any questions you have, stay in touch with you. So I would encourage you to stop by there. Uh, also, I want to remind us that one of the ways we worship is through giving. David reminded us that God is our provider, not our paycheck. And Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So giving is not just something we do, but it's actually a spiritual act, a spiritual discipline that reorients the posture of our hearts. And so for those of us who call Village Home, you can give online, you can give through a mobile app, or you can give uh, in the offering boxes located by the doors of the auditorium. And just a couple things coming up here at the church. First, uh, what, starting one week from Wednesday, we're going to be hosting a class, an adult education class called Christian Story, running for nine weeks, Wednesday night, 6.30 to 8, uh, in conjunction with Kid Trek. So if you're a parent, we'll have children's discipleship opportunities as well for children age birth through fifth grade. And this class, we're going to be exploring the big story of the Bible, how it's all one unified story. And the heart is really to, to take this time nine weeks and sit at Jesus's feet and listen to his teaching. This is not a class only for new believers, though if you're a new believer, you're very welcome. This is a class for anyone who wants to be challenged in their discipleship. We're going to read a lot of Bible, I mean a lot, and learn how the Bible draws us into God's mission of making disciples. So the deadline to register for that is this Friday. So if you want to participate, you can go online, register, deadline is this Friday. One other thing, this week Wednesday, so just in three days, uh, India Rural Evangelical Fellowship will be hosting a dinner right here in this room. They are one of the global ministry partners that we are privileged to support here at Village, who do amazing work spreading the love of Christ throughout Southeast India. And so that will be here this Wednesday from 6.30 to 8.30. Again, uh, you can register on their website at the link noted there. Uh, tickets are complimentary for this dinner. You come hear about the amazing work that God is doing for them. So tickets are complimentary, but you do need to register, and there will be um, an ask to support their ministry in the work that God is doing. So that's it for announcements. I'll bring David back up for our benediction. Would you stand with me? Let me use uh, the blessing that God gives us. Numbers chapter 6. When the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his son, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, Hear this, as God's people heard it then. May it be a blessing to you. It was a blessing to them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen. God bless you. Turn to someone, say hello, introduce yourself today before you head out.
Thank you. Thanks, Al.